Hello and welcome to the Shiny Bees podcast, a podcast for those who like their knitting, comedy and yarn in equally large measures. I'm your host, Joan Millmine, and this is episode 110, an interview with Jane Morrison of Yarnison. I feel a need to laugh again with you, if that's all right. Hello, hello, and welcome into another episode of the show. How are you? I am good, thank you for asking. (laughs) And um, back with you again this week with another interview. I did say that it was going to be a solo episode this time, but I changed my mind, you know, when I am a kind of girl that likes to change her mind when she feels like it and um, when I've got something cool and a good conversation to share with you. And I decided on the spare of the moment to change it from a solo episode into an interview episode because I think you're going to enjoy it. So... This week I'm really excited to be bringing Jane Morrison um, of Yarnison Designs onto the show. She is um, a friend of mine as you'll hear when we get into the episode and reasonably new to the world of designing and um, it's just doing something really different with design I think that um, it's a little bit away from what is kind of popular at the moment with very pretty pretty stuff it's a little bit more edgy and something that really appealed to me personally and so I wanted to bring her onto the show and share with you as I always do when I find something that I think is really cool and I think that you will like as well and so she will be coming up shortly I will warn you it's quite a long interview it does get chatty in some points there is some conversation about fish and chips um, among some other kind of random northernisms and little chit chats that go off away from the knitting then we come back onto the knitting to continue our conversation so much in the spirit of the we're down the pub and having a bit of a chat about it tell me about it It it's quite a relaxed interview format if you don't like that just just go now really if you don't find funny little chit chats in between an interview fun um interesting then you know you might not like it but hey you know it's my podcast whatever's dude so (laughs) it is good though it's fun it's funny so Without further ado, I'm going to bring um, her in and I will be super excited to hear what you think of our chat over in the Facebook group, um, Shiny Bees Podcast Community on Facebook uh, afterwards. But without further ado, here is Jane. So I'm really excited today to be welcoming my lovely friend, Jane Morrison, aka Yarnison, onto the show. Now, I've been friends with Jane for a couple of years now after meeting via the Golden Skin and then in person at the Countess's old studio in Swinton. I do believe that was our first meeting. And she is a knitwear designer. I'm talking about you in the third person now, introducing you, and then you're there. Oh, that's weird. But you're there. freaked out. Okay, carry on. Sorry, I'll stop now. Um, she is a knitwear designer and um, what I really enjoy about Jane's designs in particular is that they are quite edgy and urban and they're, they are a bit different. Everything about them, I think, is a bit different and stands out from your usual stuff on Ravelry um, and the way things are presented, which is what appeals to me personally um, from a design point of view. And there's just some unusual combinations of things that I think are really interesting. And that's why I wanted to kind of get her on the show and share her work and her, because she is an absolute delight with you. And she has a really cool accent as well to boot, to add in. So Jane, thank you so much. Welcome to the show. Hello. Hello. (laughs) Now I'm thinking about how I talk with my accent. It's fine. Don't worry about it. It It's cool. It's everybody loves a Scottish accent, mate. Okay. Everybody does. So for people who are not that familiar with you and maybe haven't met you before, um, and let's face it, they are frankly missing out on life. Um, tell them a little bit about yourself <laughs> and how you got into designing. Um, well, uh, so uh, I'm uh, from Edinburgh, as you can tell. I uh, moved to Manchester about eight years ago um, with BBC, uh, where I work as a user experience designer. Um, but I've been knitting... Uh, since my early 20s when I discovered that uh, I could knit and smoke at the same time and I was giving up smoking so uh, I I took up knitting in order because I, I'm sure if you were like some old woman uh, you know that really wanted to smoke and knit at the same time you could sit there with like the smoke climbing up into one eye and uh, you know kind of squinting angrily and knitting away on some hideous garment that your grandchild would have to wear for a while <laughs> um, but 
I never mastered it. So it was quite a good way to, uh, to stop smoking was to start knitting. And uh, so I, I've been doing it as a hobby for years and also uh, collecting yarn as a hobby for years because I get lightheaded in most yarn shops and, uh, and spend lots of money. Um, <laughs> so I, I was kind of uh, up for... I was, I was sort of, I, I think I was talking in knit group and, and saying, oh, I can't really find anything that does this and this and this at the same time. And um, someone said, um, well, what about just designing it? And I thought, well, you know, I kind of went, don't be ridiculous. And then obviously the germ of the idea was in my head and I went off and thought about it. Um, so that's it. That's, that's what ended up happening was that I started thinking, oh, I could, I could actually give this a go. And sort of realized that um, the skills I've got from my job in terms of sort of user research and how you approach designing for an audience, uh, that's all kind of, I've got all that process in my head really. So um, that stuff I find quite easy. And then um, the, the knitting part, I, I just come at it basically completely selfishly. So I'm, I'm coming at it from things that I would enjoy knitting, colors that I enjoy wearing um, and, and things that you know I take inspiration from the stuff that I enjoy seeing so this is going to sound dodgy Joe but um <laughs> good <laughs> so so one of my patterns uh was inspired by high-vis jackets and one of the reasons why is because uh I, I do a lot of urban walking commuting and walking around I think the sort of the brightest happiest things to look at on the landscape are often the people wearing high-vis jackets, which sounds like a fancy builders, but I don't really. Uh, <laughs> they're usually, you know, hideous creatures that shout and stuff, you know, and I'm, I'm very quiet and, and I don't put myself forward at all. But um, it was, I think what I like about it is, you, you know, you're in this landscape where there's lots of sort of grey and, you know, sort of street furniture and stuff like that. And the brightest things on it are the sort of these splashes of neon and, uh, I kind of want to be one of the splashes of neon and, and sort of brighten things up. So I think in terms of my color choices, they're, they're kind of really inspired by that. So that's, that's where I came at it from. And I think um, it's, it's just been fun. I think each pattern I've done, I've learned something new about how to design them and what, you know, what, what I enjoy about it. Um, but I think, um, yeah, and, and some of them are better than others, but I think I've, I've enjoyed them all for different things. So, yeah. Yeah, because I have to say, that wasn't, because the, uh, it's Urban Hero, isn't it, that one? Yeah, yeah. The one it's you're like talking. It's bat cape, but in high-vis jacket colours. Yeah. It's amazing. I'm going to come back to Urban Hero in a minute, because the first one you did was, was that not the manhole socks? Yes, yeah. It was. So that um, was the, that's the kind of, that I was trying to get across... Um, I mean, it was partly because, uh, so my knit group is at Countess Blaze and she does a colorway called Urbex and it's mm -hmm. this sort of brilliant, it looks like rusty metal and I really wanted a texture and something that looked like rusty metal, um, you know, to, to, to complement the yarn. So it, it sort of came from that and I really like these sort of textures you get from um, kind of like that sort of uh, anti-slip tread that you get on um, on pieces of metal sometimes and, and manhole covers and stuff like that. So, um, so it came from that really. I, I wanted to make something that looked like that. It is really cool. And I'm a geographer, right? So this this urban landscape stuff, like mm. it makes my little heart sing because I'm <laughs> I'm one of those because you normally get like the physical geographers who love like being out in the field and you know hydrography and all that kind of stuff. And I do yeah. like some of that stuff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I do no I do and I do like no, some of the I... kind of old stuff you know like the carbon dating and paleontology and all that that piece but I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm a bit more of a human geographer and I like like the interplay of of how kind of the human and the physical how they explain each other and things but I, yeah. I'm, I'm like more into the urban geography and how cities work and all that kind of stuff because I, I just find people quite interesting yeah so I really like how you've approached it from a like in, the, in a particularly of late in the knitting world, it's all about, you know, florals and being pretty and being beautiful. And like, I just want to escape from life and look oh, at catalog God, images. It's, it's, it's fuck, fucking boring, isn't it? It's in, it, it I, find, I personally <laughs> find that a little bit insipid. I mean, I don't, um, so that is really, no disrespect. <laughs> um, there's some really nice patterns and really, but there's so many of them and it's just like the volume, you know, there's what, nearly a million patterns on like Ravelry and, like so many of them are kind of interplay with 
floral stuff and leaves and, and things like that. And, you know, I've knitted that stuff and I like it, but I did get to the point where I was like, well, it doesn't really reflect what I want to look like when I'm wearing clothes. You know, it, it doesn't reflect that side of me particularly. So it's, it's great if I'm knitting a scarf for my mom or something, but it's not really my scene. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and it is like like you said. Like I'm not I'm not dissing it. Like it it does look very pretty, and it does look very kind of inoffensive. And it's just like, oh, that's nice. Um, yeah, you know, very generic. And I, I like and and I, and I like you. I'm like I, I knit I knit some of that stuff too, and it's some of the pretty pretty. Um, yeah. But I like the way that you've gone. Well, yeah, but like that's not really me. And let me take a let me take a grid right yeah off of the street that is rusty so not generally your typical idea of something that is pretty and beautiful that rust is not considered to be a beautiful thing generally and let me take that and make it into something i think it's really interesting in the same way that you did it with the um urban hero yeah Um, and you took like gray and neon yellow and yes. a bat cape, pretty like Batman, pretty much. Yeah, um, and you like you put lace in it, like it's got bloody lace in the pattern. Well, it, it's just some chevrons. It's because I wanted a bit of a zigzag going on. It was just, you know, what that was. It's because that's where the, you know I was saying there's like this when you're designing a pattern. There's an interplay with how it looks, the yarn that you're using, and uh, the experience of knitting the thing. And on the experience of knitting the thing, like you want a bit of interest, right? You can't, you know, so I don't don't get me wrong. Like my new one's got loads of garter in it and it's an absolute joy. I was knitting a sample in the cinema the other day because I didn't need to look at it at all, you know? And so it's like, um, so I enjoy that as well. But uh, for something, you know, I I think, you know, some easy to memorize bit of lace or, or cabling or something like that can really just sort of, uh, keep you interested in the thing and get allow you to finish it you know so some of it was that some of it was I wanted to create these sort of zigzags and the chevron does that so you end up with these sort of bolts of lightning in the in the shaping uh, where the because it's got these short road triangles as well and those triangles look like sort of bolts of lightning so it was it was to try and achieve that effect um, so it's really just the best tool for the job you know but um, it looks quite good I think lace is really interesting because um, you know, you can do quite interesting floral stuff. And like, you know, some of the some of the patterns that like Carrie Westerman or, you know, Boonits or something like that does, you get these amazing sort of shapes that come out of that. Um, but it's also at its plainest level, you can just create a, a mesh. You know, you can create something really gritty and really quite hard looking. Um, so I think it's not as simple as it's this sort of delicate, beautiful thing. It's It, 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 it can do all sorts of stuff. Yeah, I, I do subscribe to the masculine lace theory that there is, there is there's feminine lace and there's masculine lace. Mm. There's definitely, but it's like again, like even any kind of like open work, if you want to call it that, rather than lace, it's not yeah. really something you associate with um, with builders, really. Like it's not. No, it's not. No, it's not, I mean no, my, my brother's a builder. Like I, 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 <laughs> I'm not seeing him in lace, like. Stone Island, yeah, lace, not so much. I don't know. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Some of this is to, it's like, let's let's not get too too. Uh, I was just going to get into gender identity stuff, but I think it's really interesting because, like, there are some skills that builders have got that are awfully similar to what are considered domestic arts. Mm-hmm. So I was watching a guy plastering the wall the other day because we're getting a, we're, you know, like we've just bashed our fireplace in so um, to get something done with it. And uh, the, the way he was plastering is exactly the same as the way I do bar cream on a, on a cake. And that is the same damn skill. So, you know, the fact it's with slightly different materials, it's the same skill, like your ability to make a smooth, flat thing. That's just like, so I feel the same way. It's like... With, with lace knitting, maybe they don't do that much lace knitting, but they use a lot of chicken wire, you know. <laughs> so, anyway. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And like my brother, he built me, he's built me a, um, a boma and a fire pit and a bry area, barbecue. It's like a seating area. Um, yeah. A boma. A boma. Um, because I, I want to pretend that I still live in South Africa, even though I don't. Like, I live in the north. It's, I got the sense that there were some South African words in there, but I didn't yeah. understand them. But I get your meaning. A fire pit sounds good. I like saying fire, fire to pit, stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and he built that, right? So, and he, he designed it, like, he, he drew it out. And then 
he it, obviously like he has to work out how many bricks he needs and which way they're going to go and how he's going to cut the bricks so that they work and there's, there's actually quite a lot of maths and figuring out with that as well in the same yeah. way that there is with a pattern like it's yeah, all yeah. building exactly it, it's the same way you do with coding like right. it's all building absolutely so it's just you know the fact that it's been sort of turned into a masculine thing suddenly you don't use the same words for it mm-hmm. but it's all basically handicrafts and synthesizing multiple sort of facets of discipline together so you need the maths you need to be good with your hands you need to have an eye you know all these things have to work together really to get a good um to get, to get a good design together i love that i love where we kind of like slip from like knitting into building into <laughs> plastering into ux into design in general principles like all the yeah. one sentence yeah the best conversations <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I really, again, I want to come back to you because, uh, well, my own selfish reasons. I'm not even going to say it's selfish, not selfish. I just want to know. Um, <laughs> like we come, come back to that urban landscape part and you talked yeah. about being this person um, in the urban landscape and walking urbanly yeah, um, and picking up these different flashes of, of life yeah. within that landscape and how that um, informs your design process really because you did yeah. a beanie recently that was like a skyline. Yeah, that's exact. That that is the closest I could transpose of the skyline I get walking along the ship canal to work, mm-hmm. um, the Manchester ship canal. So uh, you know, there's there's a lot of building work happening in Manchester all the time, yeah. as far as I can tell. Um, and there's just all this all these cranes, and they sort of interact with each other, and then all these you know buildings popping up. Um, and whether or not you like them, sometimes I'm like, what is that ugly piece of crap? <laughs> but anyway. Um, it's it's just this sort of sense of aliveness that goes with it is is really cool and I like the way it's right beside water and there's you know there's swans sticking their arses up into the air when you're walking along and stuff like that as well you know so there's all these things that you're surrounded by um so it's, I was trying to get that but then there was also for me the fun of working out how to put a stranded pattern together because I hadn't done it before you know so just kind of working out what's the longest float that you can live with and how can you get the head shaping right while you're doing that? You know, so, so that was all kind of the mental, uh, the intellectual exercise for me was, was figuring all that stuff out. Um, and then it's uh, playing with the colors on that as well. I mean, obviously you need two high contrast yarns, but um, you can do something really on the nose and just have like gray with light gray for the sky. And one of my sample knitters did that and actually looked lovely. Um, but you know, for me, my favorite one's probably the one that I did with Countess Yarns, which is this sort of dark, uh, radioactive colored pink and incredibly neon yellow. And the two of them together, like proper kind of never mind the bollocks sort of color scheme together. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's probably my favorite thing and I'm not very, I'm not very disciplined with keeping my samples nice because I tend to just wear them all the time. Mm. <laughs> so that's one of the hats that I've. Uh, probably not treated very well because I'm wearing it too much instead of just leaving it for attractive pattern shoots and things like that. <laughs> but I love that. It kind of plays into the utilitarian sort of yeah. attitude you've got to it. And I guess you are a UX designer, like you're about using stuff, you, the user yeah. experience, like that's what yeah. you do. <laughs> so you well, can't just make yeah. something and then not use it. Like I know it's maddening. <laughs> like the idea that you just have samples that sit at the side and like, what? No, it's for putting on. <laughs> Um, yeah I think it also like recently uh, the last couple of patterns I've done I've ended up iterating them so many times and I think it's just because (sighs) it's partly like lazy it's partly like I don't want to sit down with a spreadsheet so I end up just knitting the thing and going oh I don't like it and fixing it and knitting it again (laughs) Um, when I could probably sit down and work it out with a mask and only have to knit it once or twice to get to the right place. And I don't really like knit, ripping things down either. So I'll tend to knit like uh, with the hat, I was really learning about sort of head shaping and I wanted to, you know, kind of get a clear idea of each size. So I ended up knitting each size. So every one of my family has basically got the same hat. Now. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> we can walk around like an embarrassing Christmas card together. Um, so <laughs> It's, uh, yeah, awkward family photo shoot time. Um, but I think, um, you know, for me, I, just like the physical experience of knitting it really helps me understand it and, and make sure that I'm kind of communicating that in the pattern well. 
Yeah, definitely. And I like how you brought that in because, um, well, I mean, I've talked, I've talked to probably hundreds of people about the way they design and how, you know, what's their process? How did they get started? Like, yeah. um, what, what's their inspiration? And but you're probably the first person that's come in and said, yeah, but it's about the experience of it's m- kind of playing off these three different things together about, you know, how it looks and your inspiration and then the experience of the knitter and how, yeah. how that comes, that, that is a big part of it. Um, it is and it's like I'm constantly you're constantly trading those things off against each other so for Urban Hero and for Urban Festival I I ended up using an I-cord bind off around the whole thing because it just made the shawl hang so much better in both cases Um, and doing that I-cord bind off is just stultifying it's so boring and I really wish it there was a more, like if, a, if my brain worked slightly better, I'm sure I could have done it so that you were doing it as you were knitting the thing, but I hadn't figured out how to do it. So you end up doing it at the end and um, you just have to kind of strap in, you know, find yourself a, <laughs> a box set and do it, you know. <laughs> but it's, um, so there's things like that where I'm like, I know the experience isn't ideal, but it's worth it for the design. Mm-hmm. And then there's other times where you're going, well, actually, I'm going to do a simpler thing here because then it'll be a fun, it'll be more fun to knit. And, you know, it's, it, you end up with a really nice garment, but maybe not exactly what I had in my head the first time I thought about it. So, you know, yeah, there's trade-offs all the time. I like that. I like, cause again, no one's really spoken about that trade-off. It's always been like, I had this idea and this is how I manifested it into reality and look at this beautiful stitch pattern. And that's cool. That, that's good. Yeah, yeah. I, well, I like, I, I like your practical approach to it in terms of like, well, I want this and I want that and I can't have everything. So this is, this is how I'm going to do it. And just accept the fact that you're, ne- you're never going to have everything you want in a pattern. But I think that's very much the heart of what designing is, is, is kind of, you know working within constraints and trying Mm. to achieve what you're you know working out what you can achieve within those constraints um and sometimes you know i'm coming at it from a sort of practical point of view as a knitter it's like well i bought a bunch of yarn (laughs) which i really like the look of and now i have no idea what the hell to do with it Mm. so trying to come up with something that will fit that yarn so that's you know it's sometimes I'm coming at it from that point of view like if I really like it you know that's that was true the boomtown beanie was like it's like well if I really really love some DK yarn I'll probably buy a couple of balls in contrasting colors and then go what am I going to do with these (laughs) (laughs) so having like a two color bear oil is is the sort of thing you can do with that you know in stranded knits um, you know a nice way of using two colors that you found that, that go together um, so that's that you know a lot of my reasoning comes from that point of view as well yeah it is it is really interesting like I've not really thought about it in well I have thought about it clearly I have thought about it I've been in a long time but not thought about it in that kind of sort of detail before in terms of like you have these people who um like they, they, I, I know these people exist. I know one pe- person who does this, like one, maybe two people who do this. Um, and they have this idea where they want to knit something and then they go buy the yarn to knit that pattern and then they knit it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like people do that. I know. Um, but I'm not, I'm a you. I'm like, oh, I like that colour. Oh, this looks really good with it. I'm just going to buy it. Like it'll, it'll tell me what it wants to be. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. And does it? No. no <laughs> I mean, not usually, it no. Doesn't. Um, you know, it goes so to you, commune you in up, the stash. You, it goes yeah. to a big house party in my cupboard. <laughs> Which you can enjoy. And like and I said, you know, I think, as I've said, I, you know, I think there's two separate hobbies, right? There's the, mm. there's the knitting hobby and the collecting yarn hobby. <laughs> there is. I, I firmly believe yeah. in that. Collecting yeah, yeah. is a thing. Like collecting yarn is a valid collecting hobby. Everybody collects <laughs> something though. If it's yeah. not yarn, you'll collect something else. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think like my uh, my completely brilliant sister-in-law, Catherine, uh, Catherine Limer, is a, a knitting teacher and she's she's my tech editor now for the last couple of patterns. And um, she she's done some designs as well. And she is so much more organized in her thinking about it. Like she if she gets the yarn, she's got a pattern in mind to put with the yarn. She you know, she doesn't always do it to the order she she intends in the first place. So she's not little miss perfect but she's uh yeah she's got a very kind of more much more organized approach to it than i do and i'm always very 
uh, impressed, <laughs> slightly intimidated, because I'm just like, you know, if I go to a yarn festival, I just turn into a mad person and I get in the haze and buy a load of stuff and go, oh, it's great, look at all my stuff. You know? <laughs> um, and then try and work out what to do with it afterwards. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I can appreciate the level of control it requires to actually have things like written, to, to, to plan before a yarn festival, to write stuff down, right? And I then, know. and then go to the people that you planned, like, how do you do that? I'm, I, I like, I need to walk around like it's a street market, like till I can yeah. smell something I want to eat, you know, like I, yeah. I, I need to soak it in and, and, and let it all swirl around and, and just not feel kind of bounded by these these plans I made before like I yeah, hope for them just to happen yeah there's benefits to the way we're operating as well because mm. there's more chance for serendipity and you know ooh, and I did a thing and this happened you know so I think so and, and definitely the way my brain works I like to suck in a lot of data like get the intelligence go around like yeah. suck it all in and then let it kind of process something it'll go right this is what you need to do with this one this one this one this one and mm. then I can go go get it yeah yeah. So it's not just just whimsy like oh, let me just collect a lot of yarn because I can like there there is a process <laughs> there but it's just not 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 that scary level of organisation. Like, yeah, I can't yeah. I can't do that. Not even with the kids. Like I can't even do that with the kids. Like that doesn't happen. I can't do it at my Sainsbury's shop. Like can't. All the supermarkets are available. Obviously, I'm not being paid yeah. for that kind of little name drop there. <laughs> <laughs> but I do shop at the orange supermarket at the moment anyway, and. Um, like it's whatever's then. closest isn't it no but, no no it's just whoever's got the nicest delivery man they have the nicest really? delivery man yeah yeah interesting i don't like tesco's because they um they've got an aggressive land acquisition policy that i don't appreciate yeah um, they bought a pub that i liked when the corner of my mum and dad's and turned it into a tesco um, express and oh. it's literally um a quarter of a mile from a tesco extra it's, that's enormous that's rubbish. um and and then they said they consulted everyone and they didn't um and then after that i wouldn't shop with them anymore so because i am that i am that person like I am that aggressive about my, my purchasing decisions. So yeah. well, that's better than me. I just mm. go there because I go to Tesco's because you can get your flu shot there and they can get in the, and you can do your nails as well. That are one. So, you know, and it's the sort of place I come home and say, look, look, family, I've bought this. And they look at me askance and go, why have you bought another stupid item that we don't need? So yeah, I'm that person in our house. Mm. Yeah. I don't know. I don't. I don't. I just. I don't like the rest. I used to work for Tesco, so that's quite bad. But like when I was at uni, I, w- I worked at the one on Upper Brook Street. You know, the little petrol station on Upper Brook Street. That's a little I, Tesco's as well. You know how you were saying you're good at geography. I yeah. can't remember any street names or where they are. So just, just warning you. Okay, well, like Oxford Road is the one with all the buses. <laughs> I the know that on. road. Yes, right. I know well, that there's one. another road that runs parallel to it. Yes. All the way down to like, um. Fallowfield and stuff right so it's it's kind of to the left so it's, oh yeah it's okay to, the big road yeah so um you know you have the hospitals you have scary mary's and the mri and everything yeah and i had like a child a in wide. one of them yeah 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 well um oxford road is one side of those and then the, the big street on the other side the a34 that's upper brook street right and on yeah. that right next to scary mary's and the mri is a tesco's um, right with the petrol station that i used to work at when i was at uni oh, okay yeah, that was long. And in no way uh, knitting related. I feel like it was an important conversation to have though. It was. I'm glad, yeah. you, I'm glad you said People it. People might go on yarn bomb it now in my honour. Like <laughs> John Melman worked here in two thousand and four. <laughs> 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 or not. It got there was a lot of armed robberies though. There were a lot of armed robberies. Did you um, get armed robbered? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, Did you get held off at times. gunpoint or just at knife point? No, they just they just come in with big bats. Oh my god! Yeah, like full on. It's either that, or you get all of like the Coronation Street people coming in on the way home to Wilmslow, darling. And um, for a minute there, I thought you meant the Corey guys were coming in with baseball bats. No, no, because that was that little one. Um, one of the Platts is Sarah Platt, is it? She's tiny, like she's like proper know. little. Well, she was in she was she was in Thingy in, in Coronation Street, and she looked pretty small there. But in real life, she was like a pygmy. She was tiny. Like, tiny and she's coming and buy a petrol and i'm like dude can, like, can you even see over the steering wheel um <laughs> maybe yeah. she's got one of the special booster seats probably probably in footballers and stuff i didn't know who they were but they have big no. cars i saw wayne rooney rooney once in a in a sainsbury's so Did i was you? quite that was quite yeah because we used to live right in the center of town when we first moved up from london and mm. uh yeah, he was in the same space. And the only reason I knew it was him was because there was a woman begging outside and uh, this bloke in a like a like a stupid hat gave her some money and she went, Holy shit, it's Wayne Rooney <laughs> 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 And that's how I, I, I knew. That. 
So yeah, there you go. He's charitable and he wears stupid hats. That's what I know about him. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll skip over all the grannies and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Next, um, <laughs> back to the knitting. I wonder if there's a knitted Wayne Rooney. Let me put that on my list to have a well, look for a pattern things to look up. for a yes. knitted Wayne Rooney because apparently there is a knitted Royal Wedding available for, for the new edition of the Royal Wedding. Oh. Um, <laughs> so there is apparently. Uh, but I mean, who doesn't want a knitted ginger, right? Like... I have a ginger totally. child. I don't need a knitted ginger person as I well. Love a ginger, I love a ginger. Uh, yeah, love it. Anyway, anyway, back to the knitting. Back to the Sorry. knitting. <laughs> I know, awful one. I'm probably not even going to cut it out either because you know, like, we're, this is what we would talk about at the pub. Like, we've had conversation, many conversations along along these random lines before. Yeah. Um. So talk to me about yarn then, because we've we've talked a little bit about the designing, and we've we talked yeah. we went into a bit about our kind of uh, respective acquisition processes mm. for yarn, which are, are quite similar for both. Highly of us, methodical, yeah, yeah, I, I like that. Um, but tell us about some of your favourites. Who are your favourite yarnies? Um, who do you find works really well with your aesthetic? Well, obviously, um, uh. Countess of Blaze stuff is probably what I did my first designs in. And um, I really like neons and bright stuff, and, and she has plenty of that um, available. So um, obviously I've got to mention Lindsay. Um, I think it, uh, in terms of other people that I've used quite a lot of or that, that, um, that I'm attracted to, um, a Knitting Goddess uh yeah yarns i've used sure. loads of and um it was it was her minis that kind of inspired me for the for the new pattern that i'm bringing out soon um so uh so i have to mention that as well and then other ones that you know i've picked up at yarn fairs and stuff like that um five moons has got some really nice stuff and you know mm. beautiful colors with a bit you know just i don't know not not every lurex uh, sparkle is is made of the same stuff, is it? You know, I think no. that hers is sort of nice and subtle and, and beautiful. Um, so I really like Five Moons, and um, oh god, there's kind of too many to mention, really. I'm always get oh yeah, River Knits. Um, I, I the I've I, I got she's got they've got this great sort of wall of minis. So you can go and do a pick and mix if she's ever at a yarn fair. Um, and that's that's super fun and uh, highly dangerous. <laughs> um, but most recent stuff that I've been picking up, I'm I'm kind of thinking about uh, designing something bigger. So I've moved to a a, high, a bigger weight. So I'm, I'm moving off my fingering into my DK a bit more. And as a result, uh, I got a bunch of really lovely DK minis from Rainbow Heirloom when I was in EYF this year. So mm. I'm looking forward to knitting them up with uh, some. Oh, cool, culty Nordic yarn that I've forgotten the name of. <laughs> so I've got a neutral from one place and then a bunch of bright colours from somewhere else. I like knitting like that as well. Like find a way of showcasing some really bright colours or variegated colours, you know. So um, again, you know, talking of, of, of trying to solve kind of stash problems, I think um, that's that's where the Urban Festival design came from was really to sort of, say, all right, well, I've got loads of crazy variegated stuff. How am I going to use it? And so the idea with that was to take two kind of pretty strongly contrasting but variegated yarns and, and, and make them work together. I love that because I was just about to ask you because obviously, I mean, I'm a big fan of the brights. Like I'm not an insipid mm. yarn person. I'm not an insipid anything person really. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I do, I like those bold kind of colours. Um, yeah, yeah. And and I, I like I like my variegated, especially if they are equal length of of color. Then I'm very mm. pleased with that. Like a good gradient, love um, like the mini mini sets, like how they've they've been put into designs is really interesting. Mm. Um, but they can be a bit intimidating, especially variegated yarns can be quite intimidating. What are some yeah. of your tips for for good patterns and how to approach choosing a pattern for a variegated yarn? Well, so it depends how wildly variegated it is. You know, it kind of, uh, it's on a sliding scale between semi-solid through to, you know, massive contrast. And I think if it's really massively contrasting, then you've got to find something that's got large amounts of um, either garter or stocking stitch in it because it's not going to show up any sort of lace or cables. Um, you know, so you'll put all this work in and then you won't be able to see them. So, um 
so I think, you know, one way of, 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 you know, bringing a bit of interest in for yourself is uh, by, uh, by matching it with a neutral and then you can do stripes or you can have kind of pools of different things happening. And I'd say, you know, um, you know, Helen Stewart, Curious Handmade, has got some really nice patterns uh, to, to work with those. And then, there, you know, obviously Martina Bain and stuff like that. So there's some really good patterns um, that, that, that will help you use a highly variegated yarn. Um, or obviously you can make My Urban Festival, which is entirely designed for highly, you know, variegated yarns. Um, you know, so it's, it's about finding the right thing. And it's the same again with socks, you know, so one of, that was one of the challenges I was, I was trying to work with on the manhole socks was finding a sort of texture that, that would pick up flashes of variegated color. Um, so that's why it's got this sort of um, little, uh, little cables to bring a strand of color across a background because then it will pick up different colors. Um, so that it kind of showcases them. So one of my friends, Heather, just knitted up, um, knitted up manhole in twee bollocks, which is one of, um, which is one of Countess's colorways, and um, that is, you know, um, really sort of neon purple, green, and black. So it's very variegated, and they actually looked really fab in that. So I think it was, you know, the, the idea with that was to to try and kind of play up a sort of simple texture that, that would, that would pull, uh, you know, pull variegations out of the yarn so you could see them. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> and the thing is, is that it's quite interesting that you mentioned Helen and Martina Bame. Yeah. Um, because a lot of Martina Bame's kind of uh, samples and her pictures, they do have the stronger colors in there and mm. the more bold kind of saturated colors. So it, it's yeah. not a big leap for your brain to make to go, well, that'll work because she's got a bold saturated color there um, yeah. and it's working in that one. So I can, I can do it with mine. But yeah. with Helen, her aesthetic is a lot softer and it is a lot more florally and, and very pr traditionally pretty. And I mean, I've knitted yeah. a lot of her patterns. I love the way she writes patterns. I love her to bit. She's amazing. She's great. Yeah. Fun. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you wouldn't necessarily think, right, I'm, I've got this neon yarn and this, this crazy variegated yarn. I'm going to go get one of Helen's patterns because that's going to be a, it's going to be a treat because she doesn't <laughs> show her work in those colours generally. It's, no, it's she doesn't. Brand. But um, some well, they do it, work. I do. I think it's because um, she's, created a, she's created a canvas that can work for all sorts of yarns. So mm. I think she's got some, you know, I, I think, again, something that's got a sort of straightforward repeat or... And using a quite a simple design element like eyelets or something like that. So that's what, you know, spin drift does. Mm. Um, that works really well with a variegated yarn. Um, so it's, it's about, you know, you can take a leap, but I guess you can swatch. I, I never remember to swatch. Who swatches? Sure. Well, swatches I, for losers. <laughs> I try, I tr I'm trying to swatch more. Now that I'm doing garments that actually have to fit you. <laughs> I'm trying to swatch. What I tend to do is just go... Sod it and start this thing. <laughs> and, then, and then measure it. <laughs> it's terribly wrong. <laughs> I have to pull it back and go, okay, I knew I had to swatch and I didn't. And this is, this is all I deserve. <laughs> As I pull the thing down angrily. So, you know, it's kind of, um, so yeah, I, you, could, you could experiment with it if you're the sort of person I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> And that's fine. We're not dissing the swatches. Like not we admire you. I, I admire them. I do. In the same way, I admire gym bunnies and people who drink green smoothies. Like I admire you. I don't want to be you. <laughs> I admire you. Like I'm, your restraint. I, I much respect. I've, I've no problem with that. I just know it's a, it's not a lifestyle I can re reliably maintain. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the only smoothie I'm going to be drinking is like a tub of gravy. <laughs> Let's be honest. <laughs> It's the only kind of smoothie I'm interested in. I'll go with custard. Cut Ooh, <laughs> dirty. Custard smoothie. Fit. Oh, I've completely forgotten I of the question I was going to ask you. And I'm so distracted by the thought of gravy because it's, it's Friday as well. It's tradition in the Air Force to have fish and chips on Friday. Like, it's a thing. That's more and, than just the Air Force, isn't it? I, thought I, don't, I don't know. But like, you know, like, I don't need more than one excuse to eat fish and chips with gravy yeah, on. This is an important question. Oh, do you put yeah. gravy on your fish when you have fish and chips? Do you, do you have, first of all, do you have gravy with your mushy peas? And if you do, do you put it on the fish? Right. Okay. So when, this is very much for me a when in Rome question, because when I lived in Scotland, in Edinburgh, you have salt and sauce and that is 
necessary component of a chip supper. Mm-hmm. Um, but I come from a non-vinegar family, which is another story for a different. Yeah, don't sharpen, take a breath. But my 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 forebears are not vinegar fans, and it's weird. It must be genetic because the younger child doesn't like vinegar. It's like what's going on? You live in Manchester, anyway. Um, so salt and sauce is basically half and half brown sauce and vinegar. Uh, so it's like really, uh, really runny brown sauce. And they right. splash it over everything on a chip supper. So that but, is... But I need to interject. Is it HP yeah. or is it daddy's? Because there's a big difference. Oh, I think it's cash and carry brown sauce because you're going to okay, mix it with vinegar. <laughs> so. As long as not HP because that stuff is bollocks. Carry on. <laughs> And then, um, and then I moved down to Yorkshire when I went to university and I discovered gravy on chips and I was like, hang on, what's this? <laughs> Hold this the freaking bone. <laughs> <laughs> and scraps, and scraps, holy mackerel. Scratchings. So, oh, mate. mate. So, uh, so that was very exciting. So I was a firm uh, gravy person. But since I've moved to Manchester, I've become a curry sauce person. The chip shop curry sauce is now the new thing. Flipping love it. I think it's brilliant and it makes everything exciting. So I'm 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 basically saying I'm a I'm a chippy chameleon. I'll do what I fancy depending on the context. When I was in Belgium, it was all about the fruit sauce. You know what I'm saying? So you know it's it's just whatever whatever the local custom suggests. I'm very I'm very amenable. I I, I don't know how I feel about that. Like. I don't know. I, I thought you'd be a purist. No, nah, no. Nah, I, I, I'm happy to embrace uh, exciting new cultural innovations. But would you put the curry sauce on your fish? Yeah, totally. I'll put it on everything. I'll put it on my mushy peas. Hell yeah. Do you know what? My husband's from the South Coast, right? Yeah. I know. It was an accident of geography. I didn't mean to marry a southerner and dilute my wonderful genes, but at some point I wanted like a kid who was bigger than five foot, so it had to be done. <laughs> right. Do you, know what, do you know what they do? Like, his family, mm. legit. Like, yeah. how, how, how quinoa can you get? They put balsamic vinegar on a fish and chip supper. That's messed up. That dude. That's, I mean, that is like aesthetically problematic. That's, it, uh, it looks like shit and it tastes like shit. Exactly. <laughs> Malt vinegar, darling. I mean, oh, the, yeah. even though like, the white vinegar, you're like, meh. Um, balsamic. Uh, white salads. vinegar is for cleaning spoons, you know, I'm not yeah. sure. <laughs> Dying yarn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's what they do. And once I went to Bridlington for fish and chips, which is East Coast near Hull, if you're not familiar, and uh-huh. I asked for um, fish, fish and chips and mushy peas uh, and gravy, like fish, chips, peas and gravy. It's a thing. Yes. He wouldn't. He wouldn't put. He would not. He refused. I'm the customer. I'm always right. Right. He refused point blank to put the gravy on the fish and chips with the peas. He would not put it straight on there. He'd put it in a gravy boat. In a gravy boat. Well, in I mean, a gravy boat. At least that gives you the option. At least they didn't say no. You just can't have it. You're not allowed. Uh, like you know, she, that's not. It's not the Bernard Black approach to customer rights, is it? You know? It's not. But still, like, you know, that, that's protest. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just like. Do you really think the customer is always right? I don't. <laughs> It's an interesting question. No, but I'm always right. Like, I don't care about all these other customers, but like, dude, I know what I want. I've been, I was brought up on this. This is what you order at the chippy. Like, if I'd asked him for pee wet, like, his, 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 his arse would have fallen out. Literally, his world. His arse would have fallen out of this world. Asked him for what? Pee wet. What's pee wet? Oh, jeez. <laughs> You're supposed to be northern, aren't you? I'm foreign. I'm from Scotland. <sighs> Things are different there. And I have a bad memory. So I've probably been told and I can't remember. Right, so pee wet is like what you get when you can't afford peas. So let's say your mum gives you a quid and lets you go to the chippy for your tea with all your mates, right? Is it, but, the, is it the runoff from from some, from some a can of mushy peas? Is this what like we're talking about? I like that, but it's kind of in between because it's wigging, isn't it? So they're going to have cooked these, these mushy peas for like a million years. So they become like a, just a kind of mushy... Yes. There's no real pea there. It is just mush. Yeah. Um, and what they do is they get the little pea strainer and they lift it up and they, they shake it out over your peas, <laughs> over your chips... Um, oh so you get the taste of peas with no actual goodness. It's just so it's, like it's pea stodgy discharge. pea water. It's yeah. just some pea but it's discharge. not watery like when you get them out of a can. No, it, it's like mush. It's full it's... on mush. So you get you get it all of that and you don't have to pay 40p. And then you get your scratching. So like you said, your scraps, which yeah. is, is batter, in it? Yeah. Quite Bits of batter that scoop oil. out of the, yeah. the oil yeah. for free because like, they're only going to throw them out. So it's amazing. You get like a full on the experience well, for only a quid. But it's more than a quid now, clearly. Did you, in did, the 90s. Did, so we can chippies do potato scallops because that was my favourite thing about York. Yes, they do, but they're called smacks. Yeah. 
than a hard potato scallops. What's a snack? That's ridiculous. It should it's be a cooked. slice of potato covered in batter and cooked yes. in the well, chippy. I know, like I know what thing. it is. Yeah. I know, but we have our own language. Don't we, in Wigan? Yes. Like, nobody understands. <laughs> like Jaffot. Yeah, I don't know what that is. Um, is it compulsory? Is what it means. Jaffot. <laughs> <laughs> it's compulsory. Um, Do I have to? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Which, you can imagine my poor old balsamic vinegar using husband, husband darling idea. Yeah, um, it's just idea. like what what is what is this lexicon <laughs> <laughs> so anyway bringing it back off the chips god that was good that was a good tangent i love that I'm i forgot s- to pre-note the tangent for anyone who wants to skip the tangent just I'm roll with the tangent people it's right. <laughs> i'm wrong we know um tell us about your new pattern because you've kind of like yeah. alluded to it yeah yeah and i want to know about it now yeah so uh it's called rainbow relay and it's going to be out on Monday the, or oh, is that the 8th? I think it's the 8th. Bank holiday. On the yeah. bank holiday. Um, so uh, it, it started out with me, again, it's the same thing I was talking about before. It started out with a yarn problem. And I go, all right, every time I go to a yarn fair, I buy a load of minis because I get excited and they look like sweets. Mm-hmm. And... Um, so uh, I've got lots of minis and not really a uh, project. There's lots of projects for minis, but quite often I feel like they don't, really, uh, they don't really show them off properly. They kind of incorporate them in. So either they work as part of a piece of color work or, um, you know, like in a mitered blanket or something like that, where you've got just like a huge bunch, you know, like a huge selection of different ones. And um, I like a mitered square blanket. I think they're really great um but the danger is that even if you've got the most beautiful colors in the world they end up just looking like a mismatch and you're not really seeing them you know mm. you lose, lose them. so um so the idea was this was if you just match it with one normal skein of sock yarn so about 400 meters something like that and then make a shawl so that you show off each of the minis in the shawl in its own way um, so it works really well for gradients if you've got a gradient set it works if you bought a long, like a long gradient cake as well. It would work for that. Um, but you get like a sort of shawl body that's in one main color and then these sort of splashes of color that run along the shawl so you can see all the different colors and you end up with a kind of strip of like basically rainbow, uh, a rainbow stripe of the different yarns that you've, you've put in your, um, from your, from your minis. So it's, uh, I'm really pleased with it. It's it's, <laughs> really, it's 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 like some of the patterns. I'm like, uh, okay, it's, it's it's good enough. I'll, I'll I have to stop noodling about with it. I'll put it out. Um, but this one, I've been noodling about with it for ages. Like I've knitted it so many times at this point. Um, I would say uh, that you know I've I've finally had the courage to send out some test knitters in the last few weeks and. Um, some of the comments back from the test knitters are brilliant. Like one of my test knitters was like, it is like crack. I am going to knit another one now. Uh, <laughs> Does she do crack much? I mean, uh, is that an, a valid comparison? <laughs> I, I make no judgments. <laughs> um, but it, it was, uh, it, it's just because it's, it's just a, it's a really simple sort of garter shawl for the main. Um, so you can, you can knit that, you can keep going with that and, uh, Basically, also, it works really well if you've got a set of scales because you can just weigh your yarn. Um, I've got a pair of drug dealer scales that carry around in my knitting bag now because that's the psychopath I am. Um, it's, fun, it's played hell with my Amazon recommendations. Um, but um, anyway, you can, just like, you can weigh your yarn and based on that, decide how much more you're going to knit for because the pattern tells you like, you'll need this much for the cast off and you'll need this much to get to this point. So it, it's sort of designed for you to customize to your heart's content. And like, so um, I've knitted it, uh, <laughs> I'm on my sixth time and that's because some of them are for samples. So I'm not quite the crazy person it sounds like I am. Um, but, uh, you know, each time I've actually ended up, like there's, they're all different um, because it's, you know, it f- follows the same rule set, but they're all different. Um, so it's, yeah, I love it. And it's, it's funny because I, you know, it's the, it's probably for me the most mathsy pattern I've done so far. It's like where, it's, you know, it's all about me working out uh, the stitch counts and stuff that you need and, and, and kind of calculating all of that stuff to make it work. Um, so I found that weirdly satisfying because I, um, 
not a natural mathematician, but, um, I, you know, this is pathetic, but it's something that me and my husband have bonded over because it's like, if I want to do this and this, and he's like, oh, well, you need to work out this. And like, so he's having all sorts of fun writing up, uh, writing up formulae and then I'm like figuring them out. But the first version of the pattern I sent to Catherine, who, who was tech editing, <laughs> she's got a PhD in medical physics. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> she said, so um, it's really great. I love it. Uh, just the, the, the section at the end, um, I didn't quite understand your maths. <laughs> And I was like, if you don't understand it, nobody can understand it. Mm-hmm. So I've completely rewritten it since then. Um, and this time it's, uh, it's much better. So uh, thank you to her for both being tactful and um, honest with me about it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's, it's been loads of fun to work it out. And um, I am I'm really excited about it. I think it's going to be, I think it's a good one. So uh, yeah, that's coming out on Monday and uh, I've had some brilliant test knitters Um, and then we're actually selling kits for it as well when we go to um, when we go to the Dublin uh, Yarn Festival Woolen Um, so we've done this um, three way as Lindsay insists on calling it collaboration (laughs) of course (laughs) of course Um, so the main colour will be a Countess of Blaze colour and then the minis are provided by Undercover Otter who's Petra from the Netherlands and then it's my pattern and you'll get that in a sort of cool bag with swag and stuff so um, we're selling those as exclusive kits at Woolin so I'm pretty jazzed about it but it's the sort of thing where um, really any indie dyer that's providing um that's that's providing mini schemes might want to check it out because i think it's 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 a really good way of using using mini schemes so that you can really see the colors that that you've bought you know yeah definitely <clears throat> and it is about getting that and it's probably a whole other conversation that we can't go into now but that matching a pattern with yarn so that they yeah. both kind of show each other off to like yeah. a, like a synergy of that is quite an interesting topic and probably is, something I'm going to yeah it's quite interesting because minis tend to be in block colors or at least the ones I use have been have been in blocks and mm-hmm. I think matching that with a variegated yarn is a bit of a it's a it it, it takes a bit of like there's a bit of magic to it and mm-hmm. a bit of artistry. And I think you can do some of it by catching the different flashes that are in that variegation and go, Oh, well, actually there is a flash of turquoise. And it's on, you know, even if the rest of it's orange, you know, you can then capture that turquoise in, in the mini, you can, you can do it that way. Um, and sometimes it's about getting a strong enough kind of, uh, you know, bold enough contrast. Um, mm-hmm. So one of the samples, uh, the body of it is in a sort of semi-solid orange and then the minis are a gradient of grey. And um, it just looks fantastic together. It's, my, it's, it's probably my personal favourite. I don't think it's, uh, uh, you know, I've, you know it's, it's not as rainbowy as some of the ones that I've done, but it, it's, it's kind of groovy and cool and you feel like, a, you know, a, cool designer from Berlin or something wearing interesting <laughs> classes <laughs> awesome um, so, so yeah. a, cool so um assuming everyone wants to come and find you mm. which they obviously will um to talk to you about about your um transient um loyalty to fish and chips and your <laughs> wonderful patterns and <laughs> where is the best where's the best place to come find you i am mostly on instagram so uh i'm yarnison on instagram and i'm yarnison on ravelry as well um so you can find me there um just you know yarn is on yarnison um and uh yeah that's about it basically um i'll be at woolen I'll be uh, one of the Countess's minions um, being sent places and bringing her gin and selling the patterns and stuff. Um, and yeah, that's, that's my, that's my current yarny plans basically. Awesome. Well, I will put full links in the show notes so that people can come and click right through to check your stuff out. But otherwise, Jen, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for coming. No problem. Thank you for letting me chat to you. I like chatting. <laughs> So there you go. I hope you enjoyed that chit chat. Um, I did warn you went off on one a little bit and I, th- I think the, the fish and chips was a valid, a valid departure. And I don't know about you, but I'm feeling a little bit hungry now. Um, so if you want to find show notes and links and see some pictures of Jane's uh, stuff, head on to uh, the website. It is 
shinybees.com forward slash 110 where you will find the show notes for this episode and you can follow all of the links and all the other good stuff to Jen from there. So that's all for this week. I hope you've enjoyed the show. It's been a pleasure having you with me as always. And I'll be back again next week with some more Yarny action. Until then, have a lovely nitty week. Speak to you soon. Cheers. Bye. You've been listening to the Shiny Bees podcast, a podcast for those who like their knitting, comedy and yarn in equally large measures with your host, Joe Milmai. Full show notes for this episode can be found over on the blog at shinybees.com forward slash 110. And if you've enjoyed the show today, please consider going over to iTunes and leaving us a positive review. Cheers.